Welcome back for the War Room Draft Show. I got Logan Fulmer and Marissa Myers joining me uh, to talk tight ends, and then we're going to talk some receivers on a later segment, so keep an eye out for that as well. Um, man, I'm excited to talk about this tight end class, more so even than years in the past, because I'm sure it's a common theme a lot of people heard. This position is loaded. It's one of the best position groups in this year's draft class. It's absolutely stacked in terms of depth and some guys that are actually pushing for first round grades and first round selections. And I guarantee you we'll see at least one of these guys uh, land in that top 31 this year. So I'm excited to get into it. Without further ado, let's just jump into our number five. No no need to dilly dally around uh, any of these, these topics or these players, uh, Logan. I know you don't like to waste time like that. So give me your number five, who you got uh, at the tight end position here. Yeah, I mean, like this this tight end class is really fun. This was this was very difficult to do. There's it just, you know, specifically at the tight end and receiver position that we're a little touch on. It's just it depends how you what you like at the position. You know, every a lot of these tight ends and receivers offer a lot of different things. They are all very good. So uh, my number five might be somebody else's number two. I won't argue with you. But for me. Uh, Tucker Craft comes in at five for me. The smaller school, you know, he's very good. Again, like I, I even hate having to put him at five, but he's just very productive at a small school. When you go to small schools, you'd like to see people dominate. And he does. He does that. I just think there's a little bit more questions with him compared to some of the other tight ends in this draft necessarily. And I think he can be a little more. He's your more stereotypical tight end. Just really solid player, man. Really, really, really solid. Yeah, Marissa, I, I bounce it over to you. I don't know if you have any, if you have Tucker Craft in your top five or you just want to touch up on him real quick, but the floor is yours. See, I do. Personally, I have Tucker Craft at three mm -hmm. just because I like the size. I like the production yeah. that he's had at 6'5", 254 pounds. They're getting a great blocker, someone who is going to stretch the field vertically. Yes, he can get a little bit over physical mm -hmm. and rely on that too much at times, which is a downfall with him. But at the same time, he's going to power through defenders. He's going to fight for those extra yards. And I like that. Like Logan said, it's kind of like your preference in tight ends, really. And the tight ends that I look for is the ones that can stretch the field and don't give up on the play. And that's Tucker Craft to me. So that's why I have him at three. Who I actually have at five is Sam Laporta. But I like it. Well, yeah, we're definitely going to talk about Laporta. I. I know I have him in my top five. Marissa, you have him at five. I don't know where Logan stands on this. Just so everybody knows, disclaimer, <laughs> we don't know each other's rankings. It's yeah. kind of the beauty of it. That's why it's all over the place. I love it because I love to be surprised. I love the shock element as the show goes on. For me, I put Darnell Washington at five out of Georgia. He's The buzz is, is, is high right now. I feel like somebody here might have him at two or one. Somebody here might have him. Okay, so Logan, <laughs> that's, we have a bit of – I knew – and when I said somebody, that was totally at Logan because yeah. anybody who hasn't yeah. uh, been following the sit-down uh, YouTube channel, when you guys do the State of the Jungle show, Logan has been an advocate time and time again for mm -hmm. the Georgia Bulldog, <laughs> Darnell Washington. He's 6'7", 270 pounds. He's the size of an offensive tackle, yet he's an athletic monster, and he can get out and he can make some plays in space when you get on the ball um, – I guess just my concern with Washington, I do think his blocking is a bit overrated. Like in the run blocking game, he's, he has no, more hiccups than maybe people want to recognize. And then as a pass catcher, I mean, I know he's playing with Brock Bowers. Uh, yeah. He's going to be a first round pick next year. I get that. And I also get that Georgia runs the ball a, a ton, right? They just run it down teams' throats. But the receiving metrics are really, really poor. And I see a, a guy that probably isn't going to be a highly productive receiver at the next level just because he's kind of a laboring uh, bigger tight end that didn't showcase a whole lot of versatility in the passing game to be completely honest yes it's fun when you can get him the ball in space and he's a great blocker there's absolutely a role for that uh, but I do think Washington is more of an outlier bet as a pass catcher and as a, and again I think he's still a bit farther behind as a blocker then some people want to realize, although he's still fantastic in that department and could be one of the best blocking tight ends in the NFL if developed correctly. So that's where I stand on Washington at number five. But let's dig now into number four. Marissa, I'll let you start off with this one. See, my number four is your number five is Darnell Washington for pretty much the exact Beautiful. same reasons that you said. Um, he's a great blocking tight end, but when it comes to the receiving ability, I'm a little bit hesitant just because it takes a while to adjust to the NFL. And you want a tight end that's going to come in right away, be able to do the blocking, be able to do the receiving. And with that adjustment and with the limited receiving that he had in college, you're adding now extra time for him to have to catch up with that receiving ability. So that's why I have him at four. It's because I'm a little bit hesitant. Blocking, great. Receiving, I need to see a little bit more. Yeah. 
I can't. I mean, I, I'm. I'll go on my Darnell Washington rant in a little bit when I reveal where he's ranked. But for me, my number four is Sam Laporta. Um, I think Laporta's not necessarily been a later riser, but I think he's always been very good. And you know, the more people watch him, they're like, "Oh yeah, this guy is really good." That's kind of how this tight end class is. Um, but Laporta, for me, I mean, he he can do a little bit of everything. But he's it's an Iowa offense, you know. As, as not fun as it is, they do produce good tight ends at the end of the day. So he's got that going for him. I mean, he has he was a target monster there. And I know, again, it's Iowa's offense. But when you're still – when you have a game where you command 18 targets in a Division One football game, that's absurd. You know, he's he's got the skill set to thrive in every category in the NFL. Obviously, you would like to – you need to see a little bit – some things more playing in Iowa. does not necessarily showcase your receiving ability all that much. But he he can do a little bit of everything. He's a little bit more of a safer bet than Tucker Craft for me. I view them pretty similarly with their skill sets. The Porter just a little safer, coming from a little bit better competition in the tight end, in, in one of the honestly maybe even tight end you in Iowa. So yeah, it's it's intriguing, right? If George Kittle is the big name that people are going to point out to, that is a crazy outcome. Like Kittle was yeah. insane. This is probably, in my opinion, the best tight end in the league right now and yeah. so that's a very very high end outcome but i have laporta at four as well and marissa you have him at five so i'm interested to hear some of your thoughts as well if you have anything to add he is a bit undersized he's not a dominant blocker he's not the number one guy that comes to mind as a pass catcher either but as a pass catcher logan you alluded to it dominated the target share there at iowa he was clearly mm-hmm. their number one guy he's very athletic he runs a pretty consistent full route tree as full as it gets amongst this entire receiving class. I think it's up there as one of the best route runners. Um, and again, as I said, he's athletic few too many drops, but like, yeah, I think drops are overrated to be completely honest. Regardless, Laporte is a really good receiver. I do have some questions just because of his lack of size and strength as a, uh, yeah. as a run blocker and a pass blocker. But in that department, he is competitive and I like some of the technical stuff. And I think there's, a route for him to be a good blocking tight end as well. So Laporta, as much as we want to say safe floor, um, maybe I take a bit of a different stance on that just because he is undersized. So is he going to really shine in any area? But at the same time, I do think there's hidden upside here. Again, coming from tight end university, basically, <laughs> uh, at Iowa. Those Hawkeyes, man, they, they produce tight ends. They do. And yeah. you, know, you look at the athleticism and all the college production for Laporta and how versatile he could be. He excites me a lot, so I like him at number four. Uh, but yeah, Marissa, why don't you give some of your thoughts on Laporta before we move on? Yeah, you know, he's a high upside player, and I like that with him. You're getting a tight end that can basically run receiver routes, and that's one thing that makes Laporta a top five tight end in this class. But at the same time, his size is a concern, as you alluded to already. And my biggest concern with him is for his size, he doesn't exactly haul in contested cat- yeah. catches at the rate as I would like him to. And not only that, but he doesn't haul in the ball away from his frame. He lets too many passes come into his frame, leading to drops. And I just don't like to see that from him. High upside, but there's a lot of receiving techniques that he needs to improve on. Yep. I, I like it. So we're all kind of on the same page with Laporta. That is not going to be the case, by the way. I can already tell. And we already know with Darnell Washington. It's not going to be the case with all these guys. Some of us have varying views, but with Laporta, we all seem to like him and be in that tight end four, tight end five range, which to me really does exemplify again how deep this tight end class is. Because in most years, he's a top three dude. End of discussion. Yeah. Uh, but let's move on to our number threes each. Logan, I'll let you start this one off. Yeah, I mean, this is where obviously it's going to start getting a little different, and for me specifically, I mean, I'll be the first to admit that this player is awesome. Uh, tight end three for me is Don Kincaid. I think when I look at him specifically. Um, there's so much to like about him. You know, everybody can see that. But the things that I look for, obviously, you know, I know he got fully cleared with the back injury recently, but that's still a pretty scary part of your body to, to be have issues with already. You know, but I, I will, like I said, I'll be the first to tell you if Don Kincaid just goes on to have an extremely healthy NFL career, he will be amazing. You know, but yeah. you, when you're coming into the league, you know, I I probably overplay the age a little bit, but you know he's going to be 24 by the time the season starts, or, or right right around when the season starts, and you know that's not necessarily a bad thing by any means, you know. But from a pure prospect standpoint, I'm going to lean to the guys that I view that I graded pretty similarly, but are several years younger without injury history. Um, that's really where the argument comes for from Kincaid for me. If we're going to sit here and just talk about talent when healthy, he's tight end one in this class but unfortunately that's it's not a perfect world that's not how things work um 
but he's got a lot of positives, but obviously there's some clear risks with the injury and age there as well. Right. Right. Absolutely. Uh, Marissa, who's your number three? Starter craft that size. The oh yeah. We are. We knew this. We knew this yeah. already. <laughs> yeah. But I'll just like allude to it a little bit more. It's just that that finisher mentality that he plays with just stands out to me to the point where I have him as three compared one and two. I mean, we'll get to there, but those two are in a class of their own. They're up a division, but once you come down in like a ranking, Tucker Craft is right there. I got Luke Musgrave at three. I don't know if any Ooh. of you have uh, Musgrave in the top five. I'm intrigued by that that size and athleticism profile. I'm intrigued by what he did in a very limited sample size before yeah. that injury at Oregon State this year. Yes, we, maybe we want to see more as a blocker. I've heard the Mike Kosicki comparisons. Yes. Maybe more as a separator as well. He was great up the seam, great as a contested catch guy, but can you separate a little bit more? But I'm just, again, I'm intrigued by that size, athleticism profile. I'm intrigued by what I saw in the limited, uh, SAR, what I saw in the <laughs> limited sample size. Um, yeah. That's a word I'm trying to get better with, by the way. You always hear some people point me out. If there's any Boston, Massachusetts word that kind of reveals where I'm from, it's SAR. SAR, that's how I say SAW, by the way. Random thought. <laughs> but figured I'd throw that in love there it. for why I'm correcting myself love on that. It, but it. yeah, Luke Musgrave at number three for me, it's a, maybe a bit ambitious. It's a bit more of a projection, yeah. but I'm intrigued by that upside, man. I am. I, I, no. I'm i kind of like, man, you could put Laporta over him. I could see that kind of being interchangeable, but uh, yeah, I like Musgrave. Yeah. I mean, I don't, like I said, I don't hate it at all. Obviously for me, he comes outside of my top five. Yeah. Just for all the reasons I have Duncan Kidd at three, I can't have, you know, Luke Musgrave that high either if i'm going to rank you know don kincaid a little lower um but again one of those people if all things go right for him he will be really good you know but there's a lot of good tight ends in this draft and you know when you're yeah. older and you have the injury history you're probably going to go a little later maybe than you should and that's when you get steals in the drafts that's when you get your mark andrews in the third round you know that's when that stuff happens so if you know if luke musgrave ends up being tight end one in this class i don't really think anybody should be surprised you know no that, that it's that type of upside we're talking yeah. about. And I, by the way, when you bring up draft projections, we'll probably touch up on that a little bit at the mm -hmm. end. Like how many guys we view as first round guys, or how many we think are going to go in the first round, stuff like that. Just teasing that for those out there listening. And that, that would be intrigued by that. Stay tuned for the end. Uh, but now we get into tight end two range. Logan, <laughs> before we do the deep dive even more on Dalton Kincaid, because yeah. in, in Michael Mayer is probably in this top two conversation for all of us, maybe even top one, who knows? Um, we need to hear the Darnell Washington hype. Yeah. I mean, run yeah. it back. Well, Darnell Washington is my tight end two in the draft. And, you know, I think everything that Marissa and Aiden touched about are a lot of the reasons I do like him. You know, he's a very good blocker, definitely a little overrated because he's just overpowers people you know with his strength even you know the viral clip of him at the combine pushing the sled that was all strength the technique wasn't very good but at the end of the day that's stuff you have that you can't necessarily teach like he's always going to be stronger than every tight end in this draft class he's always going to be bigger you know he's already six seven he does all these things extremely well obviously you leave a lot to be desired in the receiving game but that's you know that's okay when you are 6'7", 270 pounds, run a 4'7". Like those are those are projectables. Those are things that you can't necessarily teach. And those are things that you can learn to exploit throughout the time. Like, you know, we talk about people not necessarily being a good separator. And I think Darnell Washington definitely struggles in that area. But you can have a role in the NFL when you're 6'7". Like I said, 270, you run that fast. And when he's also young, you know, he's not old. And I, I think that obviously playing behind Brock Bowers – definitely doesn't help, but there's, that's not an excuse by any means because he had plenty of opportunities to show what he could do. Um, and I think that's where, why his blocking gets highlighted so much because that's how he compliments them on the field. And, you know, I, when, when scouting and evaluating, watching film, I always kind of just try to think about the idea of, you know, don't necessarily grade somebody because just because they can't, just because they aren't doing it on film doesn't mean they can't do it. Just because they're not asked to do it in college doesn't mean they can't do it. Can Darnell Washington do it? I can't sit here and tell you he can. But when you look at the skill set and the projectability with him, if there's a tight end that's going to have a 10, 15-year career in the NFL, I think Darnell Washington is by far the safest bet because he's a good blocker and he can be an elite red zone option. Those are things that are just going to be there for him even if he doesn't get better. He's going to be huge and he's going to be a good blocker. And those are the kind of tight ends that stick around in the NFL forever. You know, he might not ever be the best tight end in the draft, but I think there's a very 
very good chance that he's the last one standing. If 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 that's your cup of tea, you know, it might not be, but more athletic Mercedes Lewis. Yeah, you know, I mean, really, going into year twenty, Mercedes. Yeah, Lewis, you know? exactly. Um, and that's again a more athletic Lewis. So this yeah. is a blocker with some pass yeah. catching juice. I, um, because really you look at Lewis, he's just he's a red zone guy and a blocker. That's it. Yeah. So you know, even using him as a blocker, it's like, well, if it's a third and short or fourth and short, I'll use him. Other than that, I'm only featuring him in the red zone. Washington might have enough juice after the catch to mm. pose enough of a receiving threat, and you can do enough with him as a receiver to the point where he's a lot more of a consistent player. That's where the athleticism is separator. You brought up a good point, Logan. Um. A lot of the time with these guys in, in college, just because you don't see it on tape with them at that collegiate level doesn't mean it doesn't shine in the NFL. I yeah. don't think that rings true 99% of the time at the receiver position, which again, yeah. we're going to talk about the receivers later. Um, again, make sure you check that out on our YouTube channel. But at the tight end position, it's just so much different because mm -hmm. their roles just vary so much. And you'll have a guy that's secretly a great receiving weapon, but he's just not utilized that way because yep. the coaching staff there is like, nope, we want our tight ends to block and just run up the seam, something yeah. like that. Um, it, it's so weird. The tight end position, that's what makes evaluating and projecting these guys tough. But while we're on the topic of Washington, because we got some time here uh, before we move on, what is his receiving upside logan do you think in the league at his apex what stats are we projecting here for washington and it, it's weird i think obviously you know it depends what kind of offense he's going into right. you know i look at him and like i don't think he should ever like be game plan to be a legit receiving like you know option in an offense like you're not going to be like oh we have a we have a, a wide receiver one and we have Darnell Washington to kind of be our, our next guy. Like, I don't like that role for him, but you know, if you stick him in offense, like Buffalo, like, um, like Cincinnati, these people where he can just kind of just be a mismatch problem when you have other guys that take the thing off of him. I think he can be really, really good. Again, I don't think he should ever be like, you know, a team's number one or two option, but if he can live in that third option, I don't like, I mean, you can create mismatches for him because they're scared of everybody else. I mean, he can score a crap load of touchdowns. Like mm. he's going to be a mismatch machine. You know, maybe he won't be able to capitalize on it. I, I don't like, there's not many people like him in the NFL. You know, I, I know the Mercedes Lewis comp gets thrown out there a lot because they're big and they block really well. Um, You know, but from a, from like a pure receiving standpoint, there's not too many comparisons with him. And I, I mean, Mo Ali Cox gets floated around a little bit too, just with these bigger guys. Um, but just any of these red zone, just dominant guys that are just, I would, I would maybe look, I mean, the first thing that kind of comes to mind, I think this is selling him short a little bit, but a more realistic kind of career path for him. I think a Kyle Rudolph kind of vibe where, you know, he's going to be a really good blocker. He's going to, he's going to score in the red zone. I think that's kind of where like the, the mean of like a career goes for me with him, but he's, way more athletic than Kyle right, Rudolph ever right, was right. too. So it's just, we got, he's got to, I got to, we got to see where he lands and I don't think you should ever count on him to be your second option, but if you can keep him in your third and fourth options, I think he, sh you, you should be in a position where he can thrive. Yeah. Marissa, let's get to your number two. So pre like pre pre draft, I had this completely switched around, but taking into consideration the fact of, Having a complete tight end at number one makes more sense. I have since switched a little bit. I like the athleticism. It's off the charts. But my number two has to be Dalton Kincaid just because of the concerns that Logan listed earlier. You know, you have the back injury that he suffered. You have him being 24 in October. You combine both of those together already at this stage in his career. And that's a little bit of a concern for him. Not only that, but physical defenders can reroute him easily because he's more of a receiver than he is a tight end. He's not going to go out there and he's not going to be a blocker yet. Maybe he can develop into that, but that is still a unknown for him. But he lands at two because of that receiving ability from him. You can line him up out wide, in line, in the slot. You're getting a versatile guy in Dalton Kincaid, and that receiving ability is going to help any NFL offense that doesn't need a blocking tight end. Mm -hmm. yeah um even as a blocker it's like yeah well he just started playing football in 2017 maybe if he yeah. can gain a little more mass there's something there yeah. but the main appeal with Kincaid is going to be the receiving threat and a lot of people would say well Aiden, why don't you just take a wide receiver there aren't many dudes at that size <laughs> that can do what Dalton Kincaid yeah. can do both athletically in terms of ball skills route running the whole nine yards this dude is a special receiver in terms of ranking these tight ends as receivers 
Kincaid to me is the number one guy. He's my number two tight end though. Um, because I, I do think the age and the injury is the biggest thing. Yeah, yeah like the blocking is not great, but I can live with that because oh, that's yeah. how good Kincaid is as a as a receiver. But if it weren't for the fact that he's nearly 24 and he suffered some of these back injuries, he would be my number one. Mm-hmm. Even if he was yeah. 22 without yeah. the back injuries, mm-hmm. or he was nearly 24 without the, or t- excuse me, 22 with the back injuries or 24 without the back injuries. If you just take one of those out of the equation, yeah. might be enough to push him up to my tight end one. But because of both those combined, it is a little bit of a red flag. Like, man, he's nearly 24 injury history. That That's a little risky. But the upside is so tantalizing here with Kincaid. Yeah, absolutely. Super fun. Like I said, if all things go right for him, he's going to be so much fun to watch. Yeah. I hear the Kelsey comps. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's not get crazy. But yeah. if there's a prospect to comp Kelsey to, he's one of the first that comes to mind for me. Yeah. To be completely honest. Uh, But let's get to number one. I think we're all in consensus here. Although I will say I'm a bit lower on, uh, let's just say Michael Mayer. Yeah. Okay. We all have Michael Mayer at number one. Uh, I'm assuming nobody left him outside the top five. (laughs) No, I think the thing with Mayer that, you know, I I think people are kind of coming down on him a little bit, but I think when you talk about all the the tight ends we've talked about, he is really the one that has like no questions. Like, you know, maybe you want him to be a little more athletic. You know, maybe you want him to do a little more this, a little more that, but he checks every box. Like it might not be like a hard check, but he got, he has everything you want in a tight end, you know, and he's, he's dominated in college. He's not old. He's a good enough blocker. He's a willing blocker. He separates. He's got good hands. Yeah. He doesn't do any of that at an elite level, but he does all of it at a very, very, very good level. And like I said, you know, he's not old. There's no injury history. There's no receiving questions. There's no blocking questions. He's just, he's super, super, super safe. And that's, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. He's going to be a good NFL player. Obviously, maybe the upside is where, you know, you kind of can push him down to a little bit, but he's going to be good in the NFL. He's not going to suck. He's going to be a good, good tight end. Again, the upside, that's where you get in the question. And I won't argue that, but he's going to be good. He's an unquestioned starting tight end for me. Yeah. There's something special to that. You brought it up though, Logan, the upside. Mm-hmm. Mayor's nothing special as an athlete at all. Mm-hmm. That is a problem for me. That's yeah. a problem for me. Not not to again, I mayor at number one in a loaded class. Great that I'm a bit hesitant about it. Um, just because I think this first round buzz, I don't know if I I don't hate Mayor in the first round. I know, like, you know, you, you guys both cover the Bengals, both Bengals fans. Very much linked to Mayer. I, I would mock the Bengals take Mayer a lot at, at 28. Mm-hmm. It's late in the first round. Don't hate that pick by any means. You're getting a very good tight end. I just don't love it, though, at the same time. Like, Mayer, mm-hmm. I think we're going to sit here in five to ten years and be like, Mayer wasn't the best tight end in that class. One yeah, of these athletic guys, one of them, I don't know who, could be Kincaid, could be Musgrave, could be Laporta, I don't know. One of them is going to hit. They're going to find the right scheme. They're going to translate extremely well to the league. They're going to figure some things out as a blocker. And they are going to emerge as the best tight end in this class. Well, Mayer's probably going to be viewed as the second best, maybe the third best tight end in this class. But because I'm not sure who that guy is and the floor is so safe with Mayer and he's just going to be a really, really good starter for a long, long time, I have to respect that and put him at number one. But in terms of ceiling, in terms of upside, I do think that in five to 10 years, we're going to look back and be like, yeah, he was the tight end two or the tight end three worst outcome. And I say worst, that just means this tight end class really hit. He's like the tight end four. But I think if you're getting that low, you're probably looking way too much into the receiving numbers and not enough into blocking impact and things of that nature. Uh, But Marissa, why don't you touch up on Mayer too, before we move on to some of our sleepers? Yeah. I mean, you guys pretty much both hit what there is with Mayer getting the blocking with him. That doesn't show up on the stats sheet. You're getting maybe not a burner downfield, but someone who can stretch the field vertically with a little bit of athleticism. And I think what you have to keep in mind is he was the Notre Dame offense. Yeah. They really had no one else receiving besides Mayer, and he was still able to put up the numbers that he did. He's able to make the most of his situation and excel in it. And I think that's what you want in a tight end who has that day one upside. You know, you you have Kincaid. Maybe he's not a true tight end one that comes in and dominates day one with mayor you're getting someone that you can rely on to come step on that field week one and put up production yeah yep 
I no 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 disagreements. I think everybody's kind of in the same spot with Michael Mayer. But now the biggest question is: Do you think he's worth the first round pick? A lot of people seem to believe that. I seem to be a bit lower just because the upside and the athletic questions. But Michael Mayer, number one tight end consensus for us. Uh, before we touch up on the sleepers, just real quick, I want to know how many players do you guys a believe will end up going in the first round and b how many of these guys would you actually give a first round grade oh man that's tough i i think i mean for me i have it's i have michael mayer as my only one with a definite first round grade mm-hmm. kincaid in washington are like right on the fringe for me um but if i mean they could all go in the first round, <laughs> like especially in the back half. I think right. there's a lot of teams that need a tight end, especially in the back half too. And they all have elite upside. You know, Michael Mayer presents that safety ness. So I think no more than three. I think realistically, we'll probably see two. Um, I don't necessarily know the two. I think Washington probably is the odd man out in the first. I think Mayer will go in the first. I think somebody will take a risk on Kincaid just because. And then Washington will kind of be the first to go on day two. Hmm. I like it. Marissa, what about you? I agree. Mayor's the only one that I would personally take in the first round. But I honestly see three, and that those three are Mayor, Kincaid, and Washington. I do think Washington ends up going in the first round back of it. But I think that there is a specific team there that ends up taking them. Yeah, for – man, I, I'm going to – I'm a little – tight up tight when it comes to giving out first round grades i said last week yeah. in the interior segment i did with andrew uh we talked interior um offensive linemen and i was like i don't know if i'd give any of these guys a first or a second round grade first round grade i don't think anybody is but even second round grade i was like i maybe i could get there with john michael schmitz but i don't know i don't i, I don't know if i'd give any of them a, a, a first or a second round grade this tight end class is fantastic and I'm going to bite my words on this because at minimum one, probably even two or maybe even three of these guys are going to look back and be like, yeah, they, they had a case to be a first round guy. But it's so hard for me to pinpoint who that is. Mayor, again, we talked about it. He's going to be awesome. But where the upside, is that capped at a second round level more so? Or is it like a first round? I'm kind of on the cusp with him. Kincaid I, I, is kind of the same thing. It's just he's more risky, but I do really like the upside. Um, I don't know if I can give any of these guys a definite first round grade though. I really don't. Um, and in terms of who's going to go in the first round, Michael Mayer will land himself in the first round. Other than that, I don't know if I, I think right now I'm going to stick with one. Honestly, I think teams do really respect, um, the depth of this class. And they're going to be like, well, I'm not going to take one of these guys on in round one. I love the depth later. And we don't really view it as a premium position could be wrong. Mm -hmm. I could see a Darnell Washington going round one. Uh, again, Dalton Kincaid as well, just given the lack of depth, the receiver position, maybe somebody falls in love with Kincaid and what he can do. Uh, but right now, I'm going to say I'm a bit lower on the top end stuff in this class and be like, I don't know if I'm giving out any first round grades and I'm only going to project M- Michael Mayer as a first round guy right now. I like it. All right, let's get like to sleepers. Like let's touch up on, uh, you know, just one or two. Maybe it's your yeah. honorable mention that you had at like six or seven. <laughs> Maybe it's a guy that you have at like nine or 10, but you really just want to shine some light on them. You think they're an underrated prospect. Um, Again, one or two, however many you want to do. Uh, Marissa, why don't you go first for this one? I'm going to take a Cincinnati guy right here, Josh Riley. I like him. He is like a Kincaid light. You're getting that athleticism from him, a guy who can stretch the field. His receiving ability is off the charts. I'd like to see a little bit more from him as like his route running. That still needs complete refinement right there, but he's growing. Blocking-wise, same thing as Kincaid. He hasn't really shown that at the college level. He's improved every single season, which is great to see from him. But still, you want to see more from that in that aspect. But that receiving ability that he has shown during that time at Cincinnati, it's been amazing to see. And he's not like six for me. He's like more like eight, seven, but he's just like someone that I think has a high ceiling in the NFL and can really develop. Like Logan, like what about it. you? Um, my guy, I, I haven't seen too many people really talk about, you know, the guy I'm about to name, but I'm pretty high on Braden Willis from Oklahoma. Um, 
I think in general, I mean, you look at his numbers last year at 515 yards, seven touchdowns. But the thing that just really appeals me to him is his versatility. I think when, you know, he's a guy that when you're looking in later rounds, like he's a guy that has a pretty clear role in the NFL as your second, third tight end with, you know, at the very least special teams upside. But if you look at some of his, his games in Oklahoma, specifically the one against Texas, he was their red zone quarterback a lot. They were running read options, power options with him. And that's just, you know, that's a skill you don't really see a lot of teams really utilize, especially with these things, this new QB sneak. You know, there's a lot of ways to get a guy like this onto your roster. There's a lot of versatility with his game. You know, he's a very good blocker. He's very athletic. He moves really well. He's, like I said, he can be your short yardage quarterback. He can be your fullback. He can be your tight end. He's just, he did a lot of things for Oklahoma. And when you can have a package specifically for you in a red zone, like that's a very easy way to make a roster over other people. And when you're drafting tight ends later in the, in the draft, when you're drafting anybody later in the draft, not just tight ends, it's, you got to find a guy that you can see a clear path for him to making your roster. I think he's, there's a very, very, very clear and obvious way of Braden Willis making an NFL roster. Um, mine's not, it's a sleeper pick because he's probably going to go on day three, maybe sneaks into the third round. He's become very popular though, since the combine, because these athletic dudes are just mm. combine warriors. He recorded, I believe a perfect Raz score, relative athletic score. Zach Koontz out of old dominion. Yeah. Um, I picked him in a rookie mock just for those of you who know, maybe I'm coming this uh, with this, uh, at this with a bit too much of a fantasy football perspective, and that's why I'm a bit low on Michael Mayer. Uh, but I took yeah. Koontz late in a, in a draft because I just was like, man, this dude is extremely athletic. He's got great ball skills. He runs routes really well. He's very productive at Old Dominion. Um, he spent time at Penn State, was a very high recruit, but he played behind Pat Fryermuth, eventually ends up transferring, and he's dealt with some injuries as well. But when he's on the field, this is a high-end receiver. The blocking is an issue right now it is but this dude's got a massive frame he's six foot eight yeah. and i don't think the blocking is as bad as a lot of people make it out to be to be honest i think a lot of people see a 10 raz score for a productive receiver that is still projected to go on day three and they just assume he's a bad blocker he's not as bad as you think improvement absolutely necessary could stand to to gain some more weight but at the same time, man, I don't think he's as far off to being a, at least a serviceable blocker as a lot of people want to admit. So Zach Kuntz, uh, I really like that old Dominion. I do. I like it. All right. I think that's like going to that. wrap up the tight end segment. Again, make sure you guys go check out all the rest of our rankings because we've talked about all the defensive positions. We've talked offensive line. And the three of us are about to go talk receivers as well. So make sure you go check that out.